many of the questions had to do with sin and suffering and why is there sin and suffering in the world. And I'll just give you a couple versions of them. One was, why did God let the Holocaust happen? Um, and then a, a broader question, why is there so much suffering in the world? If God is all-powerful and all-loving, why can't he eliminate Satan, evil, and injustice in the world? Well, that's the hardest question, isn't it? For anybody, whether atheist, agnostic, or a religious person. You started with the Holocaust. I've been in Auschwitz many times, and I've wept every time. I have many Jewish friends that lost all their relatives in gas chambers, and I've spent many hours talking about these things. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake, and within a few days had to be on radio and television, why earthquake, and meet people who'd lost their relatives and so on. This is a question for which there is no simplistic answer. We all have to face it. So, I suppose the thing is the question, how do I approach it? Because, interestingly, you started off with the idea of a personal God rather than a force. And many of my friends and colleagues, this is the reason they don't believe in God. They say, look, you can talk to me about some kind of intelligent designer or something like this. Okay, but please don't talk to me about a personal God who's interested in us, because he clearly isn't, as we look around at the suffering of the world. So, I sometimes say to my friends, and I've done it many times, okay, God doesn't exist then. You've solved the problem. Well, have you solved the problem? Well, then you're, you're shut up to a view of the universe, and again, Dawkins is always quotable, so let's listen to what he says the universe is like. This universe is exactly as you would expect to find it to be. If at bottom there's no good, there's no evil, there's no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Now, that is the end result of an atheism, but I want you to notice what it does. The problem of suffering raises the question of the goodness of God. But Dawkins tells us that in the universe there's no good and no evil. You can't have it both ways, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a very interesting question, which may be down the line, I don't know, because we haven't discussed the questions. Can you have a concept of good or evil without God? Where does Dawkins get his concept for good from? Well, he doesn't appear to, because he doesn't believe in good or evil. So that's just how the universe is. Well, of course, he's entitled to believe that. But is there evidence that there may be hope elsewhere? Because I noticed that my atheist friends, with their diagnosis of suffering and evil and pain, there is no God, that's just how it is. Brute fact, we have to face it. It's bleak, but it's true, as Richard put it to me. Well, I said, it's bleak, but that doesn't prove it's true. It could be bleak and false. So, how do I approach it myself? Well, first of all, I notice that the atheist solution doesn't remove the suffering. And indeed, it could make it worse, because it removes all hope. Now, it seems to me this is a key issue. What is atheism to say to the young woman with three children who's just been diagnosed with cancer? No hope. No ultimate hope. And Christians and other people would want to think, what do they have to say to such a person? Let me make it personal for a moment, if you don't mind, just to see how this works. About three years ago, I was within seconds of dying. I said goodbye to my wife. I wasn't expected to live more than a minute or two. And the doctors saved my life. And people say, do you know that's wonderful? Do you thank God for that? I say I do, but in the same few weeks, my sister's 22-year-old daughter had an earthquake in her brain and it killed her, a big brain tumor. And if I have nothing to say to my sister, I'd better be quiet about myself. So how do I approach it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the question was first formulated is, why does God allow the Holocaust to happen? 
Now, it seems to me that the so-called free will defense has got a great deal going for it. I have found the writings of C.S. Lewis enormously helpful on this. His book, The Problem of Pain, A Grief Observed, I used to listen to his lectures, actually. I heard the very last ones he gave at Cambridge. And he's been a kind of distant intellectual mentor for me. But the point he makes is, is a relatively simple one. People ask, could God not have, and that was the last part of your question, could God not have made a universe in which these things don't happen? Of course he could. Of course he could. You can make a robotic universe that does everything you say. But the one thing you will not get in an automated robotic computerized universe is love, relationship, and so on. I mean, I put it to you. Suppose I had a perfect robotic wife. So I go home to her on Friday night, and I meet her at the door, and I see a screen that appears, and I press the button marked, kiss. <laughs> that would be stunning, wouldn't it? Well, of course it wouldn't. In order to have the possibility of love, a relationship, you must create the possibility of choice. I'm a parent and a grandparent. Very first child I held in my hands, I remember thinking, this little one could grow up to reject me. That's a risk you take as a parent. Why do you take it? Because you know that the rewards far outweigh the negatives. Even though the child may give you grief and pain and everything else, the possibility of living in a world with relationship. Now, I'm not pretending to solve the problem, but it does seem to me that it necessitates logically a framework, a realm, where it is possible to do good things and possible to do bad things. Now, but there's more to it than that. On this question of what God might do, or a good God, or an omnipotent God could, should, possibly, may have, etc., etc., we can argue about that for centuries, and people have. And I'm interested in their arguments. But it seems to me that there's another question we can ask. Granted that, for all of us, life has ragged and raw edges. There are people in this audience tonight in deep pain. I know that. And you remember that you're a privileged few in this world. We are. The majority of people live a short life under the subsistence level. And the world groans. We are immensely fortunate where we are here. And we suffer too. And my question is this. Forgive me for going on a bit, but this is a very important question. My question is this. Granted that there are these raw edges and we suffer and there's pain, is there any evidence, any evidence, that God can be trusted with those ragged edges. And I would say, ladies and gentlemen, there is. And it's this. You know that the central claim of Christianity is that Jesus is God incarnate. And that his very name means that he came into the world as Savior. And he announced that he was going to die for human sin. Now, you may or may not believe that. I believe it with all my heart, but just listen for a moment. If Jesus is God and he died, what is God doing on a cross? And one thing that tells me, the very least, is that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. That's the one side. The other side is this. During the time we will spend here, I don't know how many hundred thousand people will die of malnutrition during our talk this evening. What about them? Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's where the resurrection is meaningful. At the heart of Christianity as well, is not only a cross, but an empty tomb. And if Jesus is God and raised from the dead, and God really does love us, 
then ultimately, I believe he is a God of compensation. There's plenty of evidence of that in Scripture. I can't go into it now. But one day, I think, I can't prove it to you, but one day, I think, when we see what God has done with those who suffered innocently in the Holocaust and screamed for justice and there was none, and we see what God has done, we will be quiet and have no more questions. That is how I would begin to approach that very sensitive question. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.